Welcome guys, it's uh, Team Init6 back um, with another video. Um, we've got some of the usual faces with us today. I don't think we've got any new members with us today, have we? No. So um, I won't, we won't bother with the introductions around the team, but we do have another uh, Cisco uh, superstar of a, of a guest for with us, um, Stuart Clark. Stuart, um, give us a quick intro, please. Hi, uh, yeah, so I'm Stuart Clark. I'm a developer advocate for Cisco DevNet. Um, I focus a lot around uh, network automation, predominantly the service provider area. But yeah, anything that's kind of cool, I like getting my hands in and playing with and dirty and things like that. So I, I, I'm the advocate for about 12 or 13 different things across Cisco as a whole uh, on, on DevNet side. Awesome. Um, so yeah, it's, and you've got you covering a lot of different areas there, Stuart. Right. So yeah, uh, uh, give us give us a bit of a flavour of some of the stuff you get involved with. Yeah, sure. So I think when I started network automation, I was really sort of focused around sort of unified API, and this kind of came about from having to build you know a lot of the stuff ourselves. Uh, you know, typically, you know, when you're in an IT team and you want to you want to branch down the lines of automation and stuff like that, there's not really a pot to dip into, and it's yeah. you know convincing the business this is a the way to go. So you know, a lot of tooling started you know with the usual suspects of Ansible and Python and things like that, and so I was I was, I was heavily influenced um, by that side. And then when I joined DevNet, because I come from that service provider area, we were missing a a service provider advocate. So. I took on a lot of the technologies which come along with the service providers, such as NSO, WAE, EPNM, uh, VTS, um, those kind of things. I kept my kind of still my feeling for XR, which is always my favorite sort of, you know, Cisco sort of platform to play with. Um, um, but then obviously, you know, if you're doing automation on XR, you know, you really ought to be doing automation on XE and Nexus and, you know, older, older stuff in, in there because... You know, I was doing that previously anyway. So yeah, it just kind of it just kind of evolved, and then kind of as more things came along and things, I got more of an interest into it. So I took on like the advocacy for like for telemetry, and I took on more of an uh, an advocate role as well for Ansible as well. So putting content on DevNet for things like you know model driven telemetry, and then putting stuff on DevNet for Ansible and things, and then putting it all into the same kind of bucket. So you know, yeah. just you know, if you're if you're looking for telemetry, it's just kind of, you know, you go to one page and you've got, you know, telemetry for XR, for XE, for Nexus. So it kind of, you're able to navigate through all of those. Yeah. And I know the first time we met uh, in person was, mm. I was talking to you about Puppet. You had um, uh, Rick, yeah. Rick Sherman from Puppet. So I guess, yeah. do you do, you, you cover that sort of area as well, right? With the, yeah, the, par yeah, the partnerships. Yeah. Yeah, the other partnership comes along and anything that's related to the content of DevNet. So if anybody's, you know, looking for something that's on DevNet, you know, not only are you kind of looking after the product side as well, you're also there to make sure that the documentation stays current and is accurate as well. So, you know, you are dealing with a lot of documentation a lot of the time you're doing a lot of writing on this as well. You know, that is a huge part of being an advocate as well. But yeah, that was yeah, where we met when we was doing the puppet thing. Right. And that just came about because Rick just Rick joined one of our, our weekly advocate calls. Um, and uh, Mandy, our director, said, you know, which one of the advocates has some space to pick up some time for Puppet, you know, and I'm just like throwing my hand up straight away in the air. Uh, yeah, this sounds like You cool. can't say no, can you? Can't say no to it and stuff. I'd, to be honest, I'd already been looking at it. I'd, I'd already been looking at it and I've been trying to kind of figure it out and I thought, well, this is just going to be a great opportunity to, to learn from Rick and learn from the people at Puppet and become more involved in this and then sort of, you know, build some use cases and some examples and some code around it as well. So, yeah, that's how it all came about. Awesome. Well, let me ask you a question, right? So you mentioned two tools, right? Yes. Uh, I don't really see Puppet that, that often in the field, right? No. But I, I see Ansible and Python, right? Mm -hmm. and, and most of the time, those requirements are, are you know, pretty similar, except yeah. there's, you know, you, you do them different ways. Mm. From your experience, right, what, what do you see? What do you, what do you feel more comfortable with? Or give me, a, you know, your comfort level versus someone, you know, trying to uh, become a developer, right? Python versus, you know, Ansible. Yeah. So I think, I mean, my experience is this is, is that I started quite like a lot of people do. I had no programming experience whatsoever. So Ansible was obviously, you know, the most one that I've become familiar with because, to be honest, right out the gate, Python just scared me. Um, I'd never mm -hmm. written code before. I'd never used Python before in, in that kind of thing. And, you know, you know I think that when I went back, when I really think about it, you know, I've done a little bit of sort of bash 
kind of stuff, not a, a whole great deal of stuff, you know, but I got more, you know, I got more program experience from when I was 12 on a, on a spectrum, uh, a ZX spectrum, you know, yeah. back in the, back in the day. Um, that was You're talking my, my language. Sorry. Yeah. That was, that, what a classic that was with the rubber keys, man, oh, loading, yeah. loading everything on it's, cassettes. It's basic. Yeah. It's yeah, basic, basic. yeah, yeah, absolutely. Um, and so I started with Ansible, and this was when you know, just looking at it and things, just because this was just for me the sort of the lowest barrier of entry. Um, and I'd seen him, I'd seen him work with a lot of guys who are really good, sort of with 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 um, Linux and and Bash. But for me, Ansible was just kind of a nice little sort of starting point, and that was just you know. Working on the really low hanging fruit, you know, the kind of the the regular requests which kind of come in to you all the time of, you know, what images are running here and what interfaces are in which state and stuff and looking for MAC addresses and just trying to simplify the roles, which took up a lot of time for me. Mm. Um, we started on the team I was at, we started actually then automating our um, our infrastructure with with Ansible. And then our teams merge with a, a different team. And then all of a sudden I'm surrounded by sort of like, you know, six, seven people who are really great with network automation with Python. So it was kind of, you know, the question became, do you have an interesting learning in this? And I was like, well, hell yeah, I have a huge interesting learning in this. And now I get to sit around the table with, you know, six people who have been doing this for a number of years and I can just absorb this like a sponge. Mm. Um, and that's when I, I, I kind of I, I jumped then I jumped then from from Ansible and moved into Python. But I didn't leave Ansible fully behind because then in the infrastructure that we was in, you know, the network was automated by mm. Python. Right. But all of the sort of back end and all the servers, um, VMs or or such, you know, which we used as, you know, uh, jump hosts and dev boxes, which we had you know, for our monitoring and things like that, they were all controlled by Ansible. Mm. So I didn't mm. really leave Ansible fully behind, but I kind of used it for one thing. This comes back to, um, um, Derek, it's one of our regular things, right? The, the whole idea of of automation using a certain tooling, but then that, mm. that sort of macro um, orchestration thing of being able to, to pull um uh, to use this use workflows effectively to to automate different things together to to achieve one end and and i think that's where what you're describing there i guess is yeah, is, is using something like the the python for the programmability and the libraries to to do the the automating the things yeah. but then using a, a an ansible or whatever to to orchestrate those into bigger workflows that may have other elements outside just the, the things that you've, you've got those those micro automations for so yeah and mm. you're going to use the, you're going to use certain tools for certain jobs and things like that you know there's it's going to be more comfortable tools for doing you know more things it's going to be easier to do you know the in in, in our case with these vms which are jump hosts and things like that to, to manage them ansible was actually just an easier tool to use than python for mm. us um to be able, able to do that and stuff it's you know, you do get asked that question a lot at DevNet. You know, you get asked it at Cisco Live and at DevNet Create and any events we're doing. It's like you said, it's a really, really sort of common question. And people will say, well, which one Which one should I learn and things? Well, ideally, in an ideal world, you'll learn both. Yeah. Which one should you start with, I think, is the question. What do you know now? You know, what do you know sort of now? So, so does mm -hmm. it, it comes back to that thing, I suppose, of, of um, how you start down the automation path anyway, right? Is is like, mm -hmm. well, you know, you could you could say it's the walk, run, fly thing, or you can, I mean, you you said it before that, that you started by just pulling mm. data from a mm. set of devices, and you found mm -hmm. that Ansible yeah. was the appropriate way to do it. So, so you start there, right? Um, yeah, yeah. Well, I personally think I personally think that Stuart is. You know, and, and mind you, most people, when they watch this, they think of, especially you being a uh, developer advocate for Cisco, they think of this, you know, super human guy who pretty much knows all pro. But I think your path may, makes you more and more. Mm -hmm. I mean, to be able to. I mean, this is what most people are going to end up doing, right? Uh, mm -hmm. If it's Python or if it's Ansible, you're going to actually start with something. And then as you get more exposed into automating, you're yeah. going to another tool that did it maybe have a different outcome or even even enhance yeah. the tool that you already know so it, yeah. and, and well and i think go on mate sorry 
I was going to say, so I think, and I think you're, you know, an interesting thing earlier is you started out with implementing and the things you automated were those kind of daily tasks that were just yeah. basic, like, you know, looking at the mm-hmm. status of interfaces on mm-hmm. some switches, right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, those kinds of things. And it would save maybe five minutes looking at a ticket or something, right? Yeah. It's not going to be big, but over time, those little things that you learn and mm-hmm. the nuggets, that's what translates between whatever tool you use, Yeah. right? Yeah. And it is. Yep. I've always been one of those people that, you know, you find in a lot of offices, you get a lot of silos between different things. And really, you know, back in the day, sort of like five years ago and things, um, you know, I was working on this big network that we built for, for Cisco. I think we we're up to 35 sites, you know, sort of well over 700 devices and things. And it became this big, you know, it became this big, you know, monster and things. Um you know, a lot of everybody's been there when you run with networks, you know, you're up in the night a lot, you know, something's always going down. You can't control everything. There's no such thing as a hundred percent uptime. You just can't foresee line cards failing and stuff like that, you know, just optics mm-hmm. burning out, whatever. And, you know, it becomes this kind of thing where, you know, you start talking about the size of your network thing and, I saw the hours I was doing and the hours that our team are doing, you know, around the clock and things seven days a week. And what I found peculiar was is that we had this really awesome SRE team where the, um, in this in this team at Cisco that I used to work in. And I was joking one day about, you know, how many devices we managed and, or, you know, making fun of it. And, and the SRE manager said, well, m- my guys are looking after 5,000 devices. <laughs> And I thought, and I, and I, I, you know, I kind of knew what SE, the, the SRE team did. I didn't know how much stuff they had, you know. I had, you know, I didn't see that. But what surprised me about the SRE team was is that they kind of, you know, with the guys always playing on the kind of the foosball table and they're always <laughs> kind of really casual. And I'm thinking this is weird because they manage more devices than me, but yet they seem to be not losing as much hair as I am and they're getting more sleep. And, you know, and they seem to have a life and hobbies. And I, um, I, I spoke to the SRE manager and I said, how, how, do you, how do you really do this? And he just said, you know, most of it's done through automation. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I was really good friends with the guys in the SRE team and things. And, you know, I, I, we came to this point was we had these devices and they were putting tickets in our queue ferociously, like, you know, like 10 tickets a day for opening up ACLs. And stuff like that. And I sat with the, I spoke with the SRE manager and I said, you know, I said, we've got to think of a better way around this. I said, because you're deploying all of this stuff and the network is the bottleneck because you throw it into the queue and then it goes through the RFC and it takes us like three or four days. And that's Mm -hmm. us really pushing at it, you know, really pushing it through. And I said, there's got to be another way. And he said to me, well, you know, if you enable the API on the firewalls, we can help you with this. I was like, well, okay, then let's do this. And I said, he said to me, so what I need from you is, he said, you show me what you need to do on the firewall because you know the CLI, you know the, how the firewall works. So if you can translate that, we can work on working with the API and we can get this automated. I said, that's great. As a deal, if I show you how the firewall works and what to implement, you show me how you're going to automate it. And it became this kind of, uh, you know, swapping of information and you know normally when a network guy goes into an sre area and stuff like that you kind of get the sre people start meerkatting <laughs> kind of yeah. thinking, you know well, there's a network there's a what's network this, guy what's this creature in, yeah. <laughs> just walked yeah. in yeah. He, you know he, usually when a network person goes into the sre area it's because there's an outage and they're all looking around thinking what have we done um and i used to go in yeah. there i used to go and sit with the sre guys quite frequently and just you know watch them and stuff and i'd take my laptop over from the office and i'd be doing my work but i'd be watching what they were doing as well you know and listening to how they were doing things and just picking up some things and then one of the guys said to me you know well, you ought to read this really great book um the one that they um google wrote on how how google uh, the, um yeah the sre, the SRE book. yeah 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 and wow i read that and that was just amazing really really cool let me ask you another question that 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 are on top of people's mind especially me and i'll give you my struggle right so linux versus windows development right my my struggle is even though i've been using windows for as long as i've been in it um Mm -hmm. i struggle with development on windows um 
I, Linux, I mean, Linux and Unix have been around again in time. I've been, you know, it's always, knock on wood, always been one of my tools, right? So <laughs> it, give me an example, because I don't know whether you start out on Linux or you start out on Windows, but, yeah, it, you know. Oh, just oh, that I, do, do I have to admit that on a, on a recording that I started out <laughs> on Windows? Okay. So, yeah. I, <laughs> I so I start, I, yeah. Yeah, you, I start, you, I start, I start you just did. Windows. Sorry. I think I did, yeah. Man. <laughs> uh, yes, it's okay. right. No, it's odd. <laughs> now it's out. Now, oh, man, someone's going to make that into a GIF as well, aren't they? Um, <laughs> yeah, a little caption underneath it. Um, Stuart so, yeah, says. You, Stuart says, yeah, he started out with Windows. Um, I start, Yeah, you're right. I started out on Windows. Um, I mean, you know, I'd had Windows at home, you know, um, and – Businesses I'd worked in before I got into IT, the, the the computers they had in the businesses were all Windows, so I was, oh. I, was, I, was, I was familiar with that. And then I went to work at this, my first job was at a service provider on a knock, and that was just that was just Windows, you know, machines and stuff. You just kind of sat down, and there was a, a machine just there, and that was your place, your seat. It was, you know, your kind of, your kind of stuff. Mm. And so then I moved into... Um, after I left there, I went in and worked for a, co a company that managed local government uh, resources and things like um, um, schools, fire stations, you know, anything, municipal services, that kind of stuff. And they only allowed Windows machines. You know, you wasn't allowed a, a, a Linux machine on the, on the, on the network. It was, everything was Windows. Um, but it wasn't until I left there that I went to work at a service provider and I sat down in the service provider and the, the three guys, which were the sort of like the, the uh, you know, the net, network developers as such, they were all Debian guys. And I saw what they were doing. And they, I think the first thing that I saw, and I got no experience with Linux, I knew what it was about, but I'd never really used it. I'd, I'd read about it. And it was one of those things I wanted to learn. And I was sat down with, uh, one of the guys and I was learning from him and, and stuff as I started there and he showed me um, MTR and I, I looked at it and thought wow this is great you know MTR is sort of like so I went back to my desk and sort of like yeah oh yeah that's not on Windows hmm. yeah. you know and like I said they were really great with with, with Debian and, and, and Linux and stuff and they were doing a lot of automation with that kind of stuff and that's when it kind of sparked my interest yeah. Um, and I started to, uh, yeah, that's when I started to learn and learn about it and things like that. And, you know, I just put a VM on my machine and, just, you know, downloaded, mm -hmm. I think, Mint or something like that. And then I put it on my home machine and then just started dabbling around. And I, you know, bought Linux for dummies, uh, learn, learn Linux in 24 <laughs> hours kind of thing and stuff like that. And just, you know, started consuming a bit of it just to get the kind of the grips of moving around the command line. And started doing a lot more things in the shell rather than just, you know, in Windows to say. So, wow, so I was going to say, so, so the answer there is, is yeah. um, what the tooling is more um, is easier to use or, or whatever yeah. in Linux. Therefore, the the right answer, I suppose. And and this is like, you know, if you follow MP Desi, the MP Desi course and all the rest of it, yeah. it does push you down that path, I suppose, of learn yeah, Linux, absolutely. use Linux, right? Yeah, it does. And most of the basic introduction courses, you know, um, that I've seen and things, they, they, keep, they kind of say, you know, you, you should have a bit of a familiarity of Linux or Bash or something moving around and things like that. And certainly then when I started doing a lot more sort of, you know, things with GitHub and things like that, I found it a lot easier to learn that. You know, I, I watched, you know, and helped some other people who came in from Windows again and stuff like that and then watched them kind of learning GitHub and things like that and maneuvering around the command line. And it... it, it to be fair, it actually really helped me. I'm really glad I kind of I, I learned that, you know, that kind of side of it before I started using GitHub because it just made it that much easier for me to learn. Speaking speaking of the learning process, Stuart, mm. uh, um, when you started to learn uh, Python, mm -hmm. how did you? What what was your learning process look like? Did you start with project directly, or did you start to learning about? Data structure about um, about uh, uh, semantics of Python, etc. What did you? How was you no, know, I uh, I I went down the brute force learning. <laughs> I really did. Um, I I went straight in with um, using um, uh, Napalm 
Napalm Library pretty much straight away. That was what our team was using at the time. So I, I pretty much picked up straight away with, with Napalm and started just doing network automation with that. Um, I did a... I did a course internally with, with Cisco. Cisco runs a lot of, you know, internal courses for its, for its employees. Mm-hmm. And I bought some books and things like that. So at the same time as I was actually deploying on the live production network with Napalm, um, I was actually learning it from the books as well. So I was just kind of carrying the book around with me and learning from it as, as well. So I kind of, I kind of went in very hands-on before I started learning the theory. So I got a, a portion into it and then, kind of started getting a bit stuck and thought okay i'm gonna have to go back now and actually just start reading the books and actually start learning you know how the, how how this works and why it works like it works because i found i got to a certain point and i couldn't brute force learn anymore mm-hmm. i just i couldn't i couldn't brute force le- learn anymore really? the other thing as well is and i don't know about yourselves on the call is that once I got into Python, it wasn't just because I enjoyed doing network automation with it. I actually wanted to find out more about the language as well yeah. and became more curious about the language and actually learn the language of Python, not just to, you know, I, not like learning French and just being able to order a beer. I wanted to be able to have a whole dialect. Yeah. Mm. Uh, but, but the point there is that, that mm. it is that much more than than just automation right the, the, it's mm-hmm. a programming language in itself it's you've yeah. once you've got that information out of your network or or you want to generate the information to put into your network you've got the tools to do that and to to take information from other sources and and do more with it that's that's kind yeah. of the point i think is that is that you you've, you're able to do that because programmatically yeah. you've got a full-blown programming language to go at so yeah as, as well as as well as that and i wanted to what i wanted to do was i started reading a bit more about it and stuff and i started to read about you know how good code should actually be structured as well and that became kind of really important to me then you know thinking uh, you know about you know things like pepe and the actual you know writing writing good code that yeah. became really important to me yeah and that's, and that's, that's, I, I that's can... That, that's one of the aspects that I think that people need to, to know, right? Because we coming from a networking background, we tend to brute force pretty much everything, right? Yeah. And I think the fact that you want to write better code and actually, you know, try to learn how to, you know, write better code, I think that's an aspect that everybody should really, you know, pay attention to. So, so sorry, yeah. Buddy. Yep. A question about that, Stuart, is mm. now now you are. You know, you're taking the, the 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 path of learning uh, of Python through yeah. on and then uh, with this specific specific task about automation and orchestration of, of uh, automation of the tasks, and then you move to learning about the language itself, which mm-hmm. is I think it's, it's a it's a great learning path. How to transform after that to to produce a production like a production like code how to make sure that now you are moving forward to you know how to create a script mm-hmm. now you want to transform and i think this is a skill set by itself is to make sure that you write a clean code a scalable code and mm-hmm. also you get you are able to be integrated to the to the to the the whole ecosystem of devops so mm-hmm. what, what do you think that the, how, how do you did you did you did you how did you reach that level of um of- I, I think it's just a case of really kind of leveling it up you know you start with these kind of nifty little things that you build yourself to to make your life easier and then you know you want to actually put something out there which is a bit more robust which other people are going to be able to use. I was just going to say. So when you say put stuff out there, you're talking now about about nice advert, by the way. Um, <laughs> um, about about publishing your code, right? And exactly. sharing and sharing, um, it, right? Yeah, I'm more talking in this sense of when I said sharing, I kind of meant I wanted to share the code internally with other people on my team because I wasn't the only ones being said, "Hey, those." So you know, those. 200 nexus switches out there what image are we running on them you know i didn't if i built you know a piece of code about that i want to be able to share it with my team to say mm. you know hey you can run this and it's going to do this and we used to have this we used to have like um a day of the week one day a week where we used to you know have automation friday where we're able to you know what we're meant to do is it's kind of really not work on anything you know except for building something 
you know, which can we can share with the, the team and it gets put into our sort of team's GitHub. But then I started sharing this, you know, the snippets of code not only with my team, but other people, you know, like a security architect who wants to know, you know, what's running on the ASA and things like that. Mm-hmm. And then I started sharing the, co- the code with my manager to be able to run. So it kind of got, mm-hmm. you know, stirred around internally and things like that for for the people to use. So I guess now what you're talking about, obviously, is things like automation exchange and code exchange on the on the DevNet platform and, and being yeah. able to, to push mm-hmm. stuff into there. You want yeah. to be able to be sure that whatever you put there is reusable by other people, and so on and so yeah. forth. And that's where that same that same ethos of learning how to, to approach yeah. it comes in, right? Yeah, putting those kind of things on there. But then when you kind of get the buy-in from the company to say this automation looks really good, and you've kind of gone through that whole sort of proof of concept, and you're you're building it up, and you know you kind of really start again when you when you turn that onto your production. You look at your entire production environment to say, right, I need to pick the low-hanging fruit, which is the request, which is coming to us a lot. And we had big, uh, big BGP peerings. We were peering at pretty much every major IX, and that's a full-time job: adding BGPs, increasing, mm-hmm. you know, your limits, changing passwords, and things like that. You know, then a, a company writes to you like Apple does, and they say, we're changing our AS, and so then you have to go. You're peering with Apple in 30 locations. So, you know, then you have to go across and change all that kind of stuff. So mm-hmm. that was the first kind of project, which I kind of really then started to scale outbound and stuff to be able to build that framework up so that everybody on the team can use that now. The whole team is now using it, but our team was all kind of contributing into it. And I'm under no absolute illusion that the first time or when I built that, that I built it right, you know, because everybody will say, you know, and you go back and look at something, you go, oh. Who wrote that? And you go, oh, I did. Oh, it was me. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah. My name's, all over, my name's all over that. And you go back and improve it. And it kind of works in that cycle, right, is that, you know, you, you keep going back over your code and you keep um, alliterating over your code. And your code and your automation just gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And you kind of build up with it because, you know, you don't go from zero to 100 miles an hour straight away. It just – it it doesn't right. that happen in, in that sense. So you just kind of, it evolves over a period of time and those kind of projects just kind of build and then it gets bigger and bigger and bigger and bigger. And then you kind of look back after a year and you think, wow, I've just automated the entire kind of network. Everything now that we need to do is automated. And there's going to be new stuff. There's going to be new stuff which comes down the line, which then you have to slot in, which means you have to change how things run, how it works, and just evolve it again and then it evolves again but you've picked up all of this new stuff and you sort of like go oh yeah i know this in python now so i know decorators in python so i can throw this in here and make this better and i can make this code run faster and better and smoother it just evolves i think yeah Yeah. 